guys. Hi. Hi. That is so funny. All the heads just turned. Like everyone was looking over there. And now you guys are looking here. How's everybody doing today? Woo! Okay, that was that was lame. Let's do better. How are we doing today? Woo! I like that. Okay. So Chainani is a New York Times best-selling author of the School for Good and Evil series. Mm -hmm. This yes. fairy tale song, I have some statistics here, has sold over 3 million copies, been translated into 31 different languages, and will soon be a major motion picture. Soman is actually an executive producer of this, and he's this film stars Sophia Ann Caruso and Sophia Wiley. Join us today to discuss the book the adaptation film. Please give it up for Soman Chinani. Just so you guys, because um, later on when we do the signing, pictures are going to be a little bit more chaotic. Let's stand up so you guys can get a picture of the three of them. Yes! This is your chair. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Someone just cut my head. Oh my gosh. 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 Oh all right. Can we get one more mic? Is that possible? Is there a third mic around? Otherwise, we'll take turns shining. You guys can do all the talking. Oh my God! We're so excited to see you guys. This is a, an amazing crowd um, here with the uh, brilliant Sophia Wiley and Sophia and Caruso to talk a little bit about the School for Good and Evil series. So yeah. let me throw a question. Can I throw a hard one to start? My first question is: When you read the book. Oh, and you look at it now. Could you play the other part that you are playing in the movie? Sophia, could you play Sophie? And Sophia, could you play Agatha if you needed to? I think so. We're actresses, right? So yeah. How about you? Gosh, I don't know. I could mean... you turn evil? And... <laughs> I would love to think I could, but seeing Sophia Ann's performance in this movie, I really can't envision anyone else doing it. I don't think I could do it justice the way you did. Like, you have so many great moments in the movie, and uh, you're just like so Sophie. It's amazing. This is why she's the ever, and we're both, <laughs> uh, we're both pure evil. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> Um, what was your first thought when you kind of read the story and, and were introduced sort of to the world of School for Good Evil? What was your takeaway from it? What was your takeaway from Like, what, what was the impression that you were left with when you first read it? Uh, I was in awe. Mm. I was amazed. I knew it was, I, I mean, I'd read the script for the movie before I read the books. Mm. Um, so the first time I read uh, the, the books, the first book, I stopped halfway through it and I paused for like a month yeah. and I reread the script and then I went back and I finished it because I was like, do I want to like, read this and really make it what the book is? How much of it do I want to be just my own? Yeah. Of course I finished it and, <laughs> and the second book too. Um, so yeah, I guess it was just in awe. It's pretty awesome. How about you? Yeah, I guess I felt the same way. I would read the script before I had ever read the book. Um, but I had had this meeting um, about the script, and it sounded so familiar. So I went to my Goodreads account, and I was like, OK, like, I know I have this somewhere. And I went to my like to read list, and The School for Good Evil was on there. And so I was like, OK, I, I know why I like this script, because I would already wanted to read this book. Um, so then once I read the script, and I auditioned, and I got the role of Agatha, um, and we started pre-production in London, 
I read the book and I loved it, but it's also so different than the movie, mm -hmm. so I was starting to get really confused. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna stop here, and then if we are to get another movie, a second or a third, then I'll definitely read the well, second and third then. We had all these eagle-eyed fans who figured out that you would, were possibly gonna get cast, because you had the books on a corner bookshelf. <laughs> so people would be like, DMing, being like, why does Sophia Wiley have one, two, three on her shelf in her TikToks right when you guys are casting? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so funny, that's crazy. Um, what, like, when you were growing up reading, what was the, the thing that most got you at, like, you know, 10 to 14, kind of the middle grade age? Was there a book that sort of you got obsessed with or a series you got obsessed with that got you into reading? I actually hated reading. Um, it's so weird to say in a Barnes and Noble, but uh, like I did not set foot inside of one of these places until I was probably 13 or 14. Um, and my friend had given me this book, and it's like this really, really depressing book, and definitely a 14-year-old should not have read it. But I did, and it affected me so much, and I what realized... Book? <laughs> it's um it's actually a great great book i uh, bought the rights to it it's called the fall of innocence um and it's it, it's an incredible story and i won't really go into it now but um it affected me so much at such a young age that i realized that books have so much power in them and that you can create this whole world inside of your head and so from that point on i was just obsessed especially during quarantine when I really didn't have much else to do. I read, I think of around like 25 books during that like five month period. Um, and it just, it allowed me to escape into this world uh, where I could do anything and be anyone and look like anything as well. I didn't have to just be me. And so I, 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 I'm very thankful to books because of that because I think it has allowed my childlike imagination to prosper throughout like my young adulthood. How are you? I've always been a reader. See what I did there. <laughs> I've always been a reader. Um, thinking back on what I read when I was younger, I was trying to think of like a YA book or a fantasy book. I mean, what was I reading? I, mean, I was reading like classics. I was reading like Jane Eyre wow. and, and stuff like that. Um, so I've always been a reader. So feel what it's funny though, because on set I'm always the one sleeping, and she's always the one reading. So it's funny to hear you say that you you didn't like to read because all she does is read on set. She's just always reading. So I don't know. I kind of started with like classics, like Jane Eyre, and I read a lot of poetry. Um, well, you guys are young enough, also, where I feel like you grew up in an era where YA was cool, or not necessarily cool, but existed. Like you know, Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games, like yeah. all oh, yeah, those I read things. All were, those okay. Twilight books. When yes! I was there was none of that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, there was nothing. Like, I got obsessed with Twilight when I was like 29. Yeah! Woo! Come on! Got it. Team Edward. But, um, Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. my favorite for a reason. <laughs> but um, when I was growing up, like, you, you either read sort of kids' books and then you jumped to adult. So that was our only option, which is why I think when I write, it tends to be a little more edgy and aggressive and provocative. Because I always felt like, as a kid, I was always trying to read up. I was always trying to read older than, you know? I would steal my sister's Twilight books. Yeah. Oh, see, I was worse than that. I would come to, um, should I tell this story? Yes! <laughs> tell it. Okay, so there was no Barnes and Noble. Well, there maybe was, but Borders was the big yes. store. Yeah, yeah, it was. So I used to sneak in and go to the Anne Rice section. And Anne Rice used to read erotica when she oh was. Oh yeah. Like vampire was. erotica. I would sit there at 13 and take all the erotica books and then just hide in another corner and just be like, and my mom's like, when are you coming home? I'm like, never. <laughs> um, oh, I love that. Anyway, it explains a lot about my work. But um, <laughs> when you were, the other question I had was, I remember when I first published the book, the publisher was like, you know, kids from 10 to 14 don't want to read about romance necessarily. They're more interested in, you know, identity stories and adventure and all those sorts of things. When did you start, like, in storytelling, looking for romantic interests. Do you see know what I'm saying? Like, how early were you like <laughs> looking for stories that had like the hunky prince or whatever it was? <laughs> or like, who was your first sort of literary like crush? Four. I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. I don't know when I started looking. I don't think I've ever been looking for the hunky prince in my books. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Who's your first literary crush? Ooh, 
I I grew up like never having crushes on people and I always felt really weird for that and my friends would be like oh my gosh isn't Jared so cute and I was like I don't know like I wasn't really <laughs> thinking about it but then when I started to read books I was like oh <laughs> literally and it's created this like fantasy and expectation in my mind now and so when I talk to real boys I'm like oh <laughs> She's always like, who do you have a crush on? I'm like, no one. <laughs> no one lives up to the people in the books. Yes. Um, well, yeah. So, so who, so who, give us, give us some names. We need some okay. of these guys. Have you guys read Six of Crows? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so honestly, I'm blanking on every single character's name right That's now. Me too. But okay, <laughs> who is the main dude? <laughs> yes. I love Kaz and I loved, is her name Inej? Is that her name? I love them together and I definitely casted myself as her in my head. And then when the show came out on Netflix, I was like, dang it, it's not me! It's a person! Um, but definitely that one for sure. Well, let me make your dreams come true because Lee Bardugo is coming to the premiere on Tuesday. So she's gonna be like, no! We're gonna have this cool and evil uh, uh, Shadow and Bone crossover moment. Cut to me, like, on my knees begging her to cast me in the next season. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So that'll, that'll be um, uh, a little wish fulfillment. How about for you? Give us your literary crush. My literary crush? Um, I, I guess if I had to pick, like, a YA literary crush, I'd just say Edward, for sure. Yes! I, was, I would, oh, I would sit there with those Twilight books, like... Yeah. Yeah. Was anyone yeah. actually Team Jacob? Like, were there no. Team Jacob no. people? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Who here was Team Jacob at some point in their life? Okay, what do you mean? Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, oh wait, there's a few. You. Okay, there's a few. All right. So, yeah. I'm trying to think of who else. Um, no, because it was always like, it was just always people, all like the interview with a vampire and stuff like that. Yeah. I was always, you know, reading. Like, even the name Edward. Yes! <laughs> so moody. Um, in terms of when you're sort of looking at how to, you know, take a character and bring it to life, how much of it do you bring from your own, like, sort of person? Like, are you, when you're reading a script for the first time, are you trying to invent something completely new? Are you trying to find something inside yourself? How do you sort of, like, first approach a character when you're reading a new piece of material? I think it's just uh, whatever my first natural interpretation is of it. I'm not trying to be what I read in the book. This is why I stopped halfway through yeah. the book. I was like, um, this is not, I'm not putting this on. Mm -hmm. Like what I bring to the character is what Paul and everybody, you know, mm -hmm. why they picked me for this role. And that's what I gave before I even read the books, you know? So I tried to keep it true to what um, had initially come up for me and then paint it with little colors of what was in the book. And what was your yeah. impression of Sophie to begin with? <laughs> that sounds a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? What was your impression of Agatha when you first read her? Um, I was like, oh, she's really moody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think my favorite thing when I'm reading a book or, or reading a script, and I, it, it indicates whether the character is very well-rounded, is whether I can completely envision myself as that person. Mm -hmm. um, and so when then I start to film and I'm becoming that person, it, it feels so natural and easy because I've already in my head kind of gone through their life mm -hmm. as myself, but a different version of me. Um, because characters that are great are so complex and they're not one dimensional. They have so many layers. And I feel like for both Sophie and Agatha, they do have a lot of great layers that we can really incorporate different parts of ourselves into, even though we aren't necessarily completely those characters. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, Agatha might be very different than myself. I'm a big pink person and I'm <laughs> really not. Um, and I would say I can be quite bubbly at moments, but there's also so many similarities within like growing up and feeling so different than everyone else that you're around and that being a negative thing, I definitely related to Agatha in that way. And it allowed me to empathize with her and to justify her reactions to things because now I understand her and understand why she does what she does. Well, it's also interesting because when when I was craving Agatha and Sophie, I thought of them as two halves of the same whole in that Agatha 
wants to to have that sort of access to the self esteem and the self confidence and the the feeling of be being beautiful that she feels everybody in these stories has that she's never had. Right. So she goes into school for good and she sees all these people who have this inner belief that she doesn't have. Right. Sophie, meanwhile, has that inner belief to the extreme, mm -hmm. but that then corrupts her. So you have someone who feels like they don't have any of it and someone who has too much of it. And together they like form this kind of balance. Mm -hmm. So when you were looking at Agatha, because you are so kind of optimistic and you know really see the bright side of things, how did you get into that sort of moody graveyard girl place without like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's a tough thing. I think um, if you could see me in my room, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this makes <laughs> sense. She's like Agatha. Because I, I don't always have like so much positivity. I think mm -hmm. that's the way I want to live, so I project that. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are so many moments where I just feel so alone or I feel... <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's like it's just I think how everyone can feel growing up. It can growing up is just a very isolating experience, even though we're all going through it at the exact same time. Um, and so for Agatha, I think I was just able to take a lot of myself into that, and and uh, yeah, it was almost like taking the saddest, most insecure parts of me um, and allowing those to surface, mm. which is quite odd to do because usually we suppress them and try to hide it. But it was like very therapeutic in a way because I was able to just be those emotions rather than hiding them. And then you have to be able to play that sort of ultra confidence, but at the same time, I feel like Sophie has that kind of deep insecurity mm -hmm. there. Like that's at the basis of the character, yeah? So what was, what was your sort of approach that because you really do pull it off you pull off that sort of like you. beautiful balance it's so so in a lot of ways i remember when i was you know writing it over 10 years i always felt like it was an unplayable part like it was not castable because how do you play sort of a young madonna who is a narcissistic monster but also like the coolest like you know, person you want to hang out with, and someone who's kind of brings the fun to the books. Like I remember, we did a poll after the first book, and everyone was like, "She was everyone's least favorite character," and they all wanted her to die. And I used to get all these messages and be like, "Please kill Sophie, blah blah blah." We did, we did the same poll after um, book five, and she was the most popular character in the series, and she hadn't changed. There was nothing in her art that made her a better person. At no point does she grow into something. Like, you know, with a conscience or anything like that. It's just that people got used to her. And people started to realize that, like, you know, she had her own positive qualities in her, in her own way, you know. Yeah, so, she's everybody's favorite demon. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things that, like, you liked most about playing her? Or some secrets that, you know, we might not pick up just by watching you play her on screen in terms of how you approached it? Um, well, in terms of how I approached it, um, I guess at times I kind of just let myself off the hinges a little. Mm. Um, not so being next to work with, but you know, like when, I, when I'm in it, I think it's just like, I don't know. Was there a scene in particular where you felt really in it? Where you like yeah. literally felt like you had gone to the other side? Yeah, the scene where, um, well, you'll see it in a few days if you're gonna watch the film. Um, so there's a scene where I, um, burst through these doors, and it's just as I'm starting to become a witch in the face. And, um, <clears throat> and I have this, you know, veil on, and I burst through these doors, and there's this really intense music, and I just sort of like slowly walk down the way. And I just hold all of the power in the scene, and I'm like grabbing Tedro's face, and I'm just saying really mean stuff to her. <laughs> and that, that particular day, I was just really in it. The way that I was just really feeling it. The way that you said her name, Agatha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I was pretty in it that day. I was pretty. I was having a good time. Um, but it's all fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of just, I mean, one of the the most important things is you think about the characters in this movie. Obviously, you have Sophie Agatha Tedros, but you also have the friendship between Sophie and Agatha. You have that, you know, you need that chemistry um, between the two of you. Did you feel like as the movie went on, you sort of developed? your own kind of Sophie Agatha friendship? So two part question. Did you develop your own sort of chemistry with Sophie Agatha friendship? And do you have any Sophie Agatha friendships in your own life where you are one 
or the other in that sort of duo? I think, I think Sophie and I have a pretty good friendship. I wouldn't say we're like Sophie and Agatha with each other. I think we're just pretty, pretty good friends. Mm -hmm. I think we, we're pretty balanced. Um, I don't think I really, I, you know what, that's a lie. I, I, I'm actually the Sophie, Sophie to a lot of friendships in my life by accident, but I think I'm also the Agatha. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you of some of your friends. I feel like the, there are a couple of them where I feel like you have like Sophie Agatha. No. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you, Sophie? Um, I mean, I do have uh, two of my closest friends in this front row right here, Katie and Cozy, which they came from Nashville. Um, so they're all the way here from there. <laughs> I love you guys. I don't think I would describe our friendship as Sophie Agatha ish at all, but. Um, I guess like the the bond and closeness that that Agatha and Sophie feel for one another, where it's like this sisterhood rather than this acquaintanceship. That's how I feel with you guys. Um, it, just because there's something about the way you guys are as people that I admire and I want to be like, and so being around you makes me feel better about who I'm becoming. And so I think that's just like. <laughs> it's such a beautiful thing about friendship is it can be um, it can be so strong and this bond that you re really can't describe like a sisterhood um, and then the same with my actual sister Isabella she is uh, two years older than me she's in college right now and I've always looked up to her so much and I think that no matter what even if we're like screaming at each other or like fake punching you know, <laughs> definitely not real punching um, we like still love each other no matter what, and I think the same goes for Sophie and Agatha. That they go through much, so go through so much throughout the books, but no matter what, they always prevail. Like their friendship is the strongest element. You know, because I kept thinking about when I was in high school, where the sort of genesis of, of the story I think often came from was, I would see like two girls together. I remember there was a girl named Stacy and Alyssa, and they were known, you know, as Alyssa, and, and they were just sort of like they were their own ship, and they were always together. You know, you never saw them apart. They were always together. You know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and then eighth grade, Stacy met Corey, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you have that interloper, you have the Tedros who sort of like comes in, and all of a sudden, Stacy and Alyssa can't get back to where they were. Like, the, the dynamics change. Like, no matter how much Stacy tries to like spend time with her, it, they can't fix it. And so, I'm just curious also in your own life whether you've seen, what, regardless of gender, whether you've seen when you have like a best friend, can that hold on? forever before there's like the snake in the garden. Do you know what I mean? Like someone who comes in and sort of interrupts it. Usually friendships last longer than relationships. Mm -hmm. And I've been a part of many friendships where that friend has ditched me for that relationship and it sucks. <laughs> so I vowed, I was like, okay, the day that I get into a relationship, I am not going to ditch my friends because it is what <laughs> it's horrible. But then I got into a relationship <laughs> and I ditched all of my friends. They were like, where are you? Like FaceTiming me, texting me. And it's there's something so intoxicating about maybe not necessarily being in love, but feeling as though love is an element in your life, even if you're not quite there yet. And so I definitely, now kind of growing past certain things, I've I've realized how much stronger a friendship love can be than certain like romantic loves. And I will definitely hold on to that and know that moving forward when I enter another relationship, I will try and prioritize those friendships because they were there before any of like the flirtation, like there's something so, um, I don't know, like uh, manipulative sometimes about romance where it's always this like give and take. But with friendships, it's kind of just give and give and give. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just saying like, I, I, I think friendships should be valued um, much more than they are, but it's kind of hard to when you're like so encapsulated with something else. So you vow to correct the mistake. I feel like we just make the mistake over and over again. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I was going to say there's other snakes. There's other versions no, of what Tedros is. There's like, there's other distractions, like um, career or, or whatever your other important thing is. It's going to get in the way of your friendships. But yeah, the point is that the friendships really do 
outlive the relationships and um, kind of keep those friends by your side. They're the best. That's what the books are all about. I have all my girlfriends, actually. I don't have any boys coming to this premiere. I got all my girlfriends to come. <laughs> I got, like, six of my best friends to come with me. And I think that's what the movie's about, a lot of it, so mm. it's important. Well, because I always felt like, when I was writing the books, I felt like, you know, you had that sort of crack between them, and then the rest of the 3,800 pages was about them <laughs> trying to get back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. This idea of, like, that childhood innocence of, Two girls, you know, were more than ride or die, more than yeah. sisters. They were, they were the deepest possible love that existed because there was no agenda. Mm -hmm. It was just purely based on two souls melding, right? How do you get back to that after you grow up? You know what I mean? And I think it's also why I think a lot of adults have trouble, you know, making friends later because mm -hmm. once you have the taste of real friendship when you're younger, mm -hmm. you're sort of like trying to find your way back to that, but you don't know how to get there anymore. Sure. And I feel like that was the journey of the six books was, how do we get back to the beginning? You know, how do we get back to what we once had? Um, and that's why I always love hanging out with you guys, because it's nice to hear like that you guys understand that at a young age, you know? Um, all right, let's lighten things up. Uh, <laughs> what, was it? what was your opinion of Tedros on the page, both script and before, when you first read him like what, what was your takeaway because people either think he's like the hottest person in the world and want to marry him or they they really think he's like the worst so unattractive <laughs> <laughs> so unattractive like, oh, this guy of course of course it's this guy this kind of guy who's going to ruin their friendship of yes. course it is so that's what i thought of him <laughs> <laughs> how about you sophie speaking of which in the, my favorite line in the whole movie is um when Tedros makes his entrance, we just cut to Hort and he goes, oh no. What's <laughs> 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 it like? Yeah. What everyone thinks. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? What was your opinion? I definitely, reading the books, was like, why? <laughs> like, why does Sophie like this boy? And I guess, like, correct me if I'm wrong, Soman, but Agatha really doesn't like Tedros. Oh, at the, at the beginning, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially at the beginning. Oh, but I mean, she's anti-bully also. She just is like, I, it's funny because whenever you talk about your relationships to like no crushes, you didn't like anyone, you were only into the guy in the books and stuff, that's Agatha, right? She was hiding, yeah. in the book, she she was hiding fairy tales under her bed. Like, she was like secretly dreaming of this stuff, but her outward thing was no boys, no there's no happily ever after, there's no romance, everything that Sophie stands for is stupid. So, <laughs> you know, it, does, it, is, it doesn't exist. So, so yeah, she would yeah. never have admitted it, at least. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely, like, seeing their interactions in the book, I was like, oh, yeah, they're definitely not going to be a thing. But they did be a thing. And same with the movies. I think there's definitely, like, there's much more <sighs> sweetness to their interactions in the movies, which I think is quite vital because as the audience, you want to root for whatever ship there is. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I think... It, Jamie Flatters, who plays Tedros, did such a wonderful job with bringing the Tedros you see in the books to life, but also making him much more well-rounded and human. Um, uh, and like, I, I root for him, and I want him to survive. And he almost dies like five times in the movie. <laughs> but he, I mean, I don't know. I guess everyone here knows what's going to happen. So yeah, he doesn't die, but um, I'm glad he doesn't because he is a character that I that I love, and I think Jamie really just did such a wonderful job with playing him. Because I think also what's funny is when you watch these kind of, when I was growing up, I was watching these Disney movies, and the prince would always come and sort of take the princess away at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like, you know, if you had these two female characters together, um, and, and their friendship was number one, you wanted a guy that like was physically attractive and kind of charming enough that you would get sort of lured in that direction, but ultimately you wouldn't root for him to be with the girl. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because otherwise, then you really can have sort of like split opinions. And I think that's what, um, you know, Tedros on screen and on the pages, that's his role. But as the books go on, I feel like that's where, we'll hear from readers in a bit, but I feel like they start to root more and more for Agatha and Tedros, Tedros's relationship, and there really becomes this conflict over whether Agatha and Sophie should end up back together 
or whether Agatha and Tedros should end up together forever, and what happens to Sophie, is she the third wheel? Do we, like, all those questions, which is what real happens in real life, right? Which is at some point, people have to grow up, and then what happens? What happens to you, you know? Um, all right, uh, let me just make sure we're on time, and then we'll get to audience questions in a little bit. We have a few more minutes, so I can ask you a few more questions. I do have a question oh, yeah, for right. you. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite out of all the books that you wrote mm. for this series? Let's see, out of six. I mean, I think each one had a different place. I think with the first one, I just felt so free because I never thought it necessarily was going to see the light of day or people were going to read it. And so it really felt very personal. I felt like that's where it almost felt like a diary. I was just writing, I was writing a book that I would have wanted to read um, when I was young with no restrictions. And I remember with the publisher being like, there were all these rules she was giving me, like you can't have romance. Like at one point she told me, there was a scene in the book where Hort and Sophie, Sophie takes Hort's room for the night. Basically kicks him out of his own room and is like, this is not my room. And, um, which would have been hilarious. But, <laughs> and um, he ends up in the room for the night too. And they were like, we can't publish this because you can't have a guy and a girl at that age cohabit in the same room. Yeah. And I said, all right, I will solve this problem for you. So Hort goes to Sophie in the middle of the scene. You can't sleep in my room. We're not allowed to cohabit in the same room. And she goes, I don't follow rules I didn't make. And then that's it. <laughs> yes. That was it. And so that's how I solved any problem. Like um, when they turn into animals in the book, uh, anytime they turned back to human, mm -hmm. they were like, oh, they need to have little booty shorts or something, like in Twilight. And I was like, if you are a human and you turn into like a bird or a bear, what happens to your clothes? They are not, they're gone, they're somewhere else. So they were like, so I was like, they're just not gonna have clothes when I come back, and then they have to deal with that. That's a problem they have to deal with. It's the cost of turning into an animal. They didn't want to go, like, so all those things. But because it was my first book and there was no kind of, um, you know, I, I didn't have any sort of, knowledge of any of this stuff. I just fought for everything. It was like, I just want it the way it is. And I think that that's ultimately what made it different, probably. But I think the third and the sixth are probably the two that stand out, because they were the ends of the trilogies. And I got like everything came together in those two books, um, you know, the way I sort of wanted to do it. I also think that one, two, three were the school years, kind of like Harry Potter-esque, you're mm -hmm. at the school. And I felt like when I finished Potter, and I'm curious to, to hear your reaction to, to, to Potter versus this, which is when I finished Potter, I felt like, okay, they learned all this magic and all this awesome stuff at the school, but now what? What happens now? Like, like we want to see them in the world. And so I wanted to do four through six where they actually had to, you know, Agatha and Tedros had to rule Camelot together and what would happen, you know? And what would happen to Sophie, like graduating school and now having to be in charge of the school she wants terrorized. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to like play with them growing up and turning into um, and I think those were really special books to me, mm -hmm. too. So, you know, three and six probably because those were like the, the finales of the vision. Um, but I'm curious because you grew up reading Potter and then now you've read this. What was your takeaway in terms of like how they compared, how you felt, you know, the difference from them? Because then I can sort of tell you a little bit more about what my thought process was. I. Please don't hate me for this. I did not read any of the Harry Potter books. I did neither. You Ever? Can, I did neither. You can hate us both. Neither of you? <laughs> that is wild. How many of you have read the Harry Potter book? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're outnumbered. Wait, okay, so tell us why you didn't. This is so curious. Well, because when they came out, I was at that age where I just didn't really like books yet. Um, and then I had already seen the movies by the time I started reading books. So going back and reading a book to a movie that I've seen is really hard for me because I want to be guessing of what's going to happen next. And with all the Harry Potter movies, I've seen them probably dozens of times. So I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so I just never ended up getting to them. I did read the first one. Um, so yeah, I guess I have read one, but I just couldn't do it. <laughs> and it's such a great book too, which makes me so sad. But I just, uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed the movies, so I stuck with them. What house are you? Well, I guess what house you were, because I think I gave you a present for your house. Yeah, yeah. you did. What house do we think yeah, Sophia's what do you think in? Think <laughs> Hufflepuff. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knew. Okay, why do you guys think I'm a Hufflepuff? Because you're so sunshiny. <laughs> okay. You guys are right. <laughs> I took the test three times because I was like, it's wrong, it's wrong. And so I took it the second time 
as a Gryffindor, I was like, okay, I, I'm gonna be brave. I'm gonna answer these questions like a Gryffindor would. Still got Hufflepuff. The third time, I was like, come on, like maybe I'll get Slytherin this time. Like I'll just go crazy. Still got Hufflepuff. Like I don't know why. And yes, there's nothing wrong with Hufflepuff. Cozy right here. We're both in the same boat. But I want to be cool. It's so funny because I went to that. I was making you a little backpack and I went to the Harry Potter store and I was trying to figure out and I was like, am I really going to bet so hard that she's a Hufflepuff? Like, couldn't there be a possibility that she's in another, could she be a split house? Could no. she? And I was like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and what house is Caruso in? Slytherin. <laughs> yeah, you guys guess right. <laughs> um, I don't know, I guess I'm a Slytherin. You gave me that backpack and I was kind of like, Slytherin, really? Like, and then I was like, yeah. I can't deny this. This is, this is the way it is. I'm a Slytherin. Um, but Sophia being a Hufflepuff is actually like, I kind of wish I was sometimes as nice as Sophia, which is also like what she brings to Agatha. She's like the heart of the movie. She, she's like the heart. That's the only way I can like describe her performance well. Is it's just the heart of the movie. Um, so her being a Hufflepuff actually is really cool because you're so sweet and nice. Um, I didn't grow up reading the Harry Potter books because... Like I mentioned, I was reading like Jane Eyre and I Captured the Castle and like other stuff. I Captured the Castle is a masterpiece. It's, it's so one of good. the best books ever. It's yeah. so good. I was reading that kind of stuff. I'm like. Interestingly, it's J.K. Rowling's favorite book. Really? Yeah. Huh. Um, <laughs> um, so that's why I wasn't reading Harry Potter. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm a Slytherin. So. I've read it. I think um, I was maybe 22, 23, and I remember reading it thinking, why isn't this book about the Slytherin? kids because like to me like they had so much more complexity and interesting things going on and a lot more backstories that I thought would have been more fun to explore and I feel like that was the seed like because in my head I was like if we could follow the Gryffindor kids at the same time as the Slytherin kids mm -hmm. we would have a much more balanced story yeah. mm -hmm. and then like ultimately we wouldn't know if Voldemort or Harry was going to win because mm -hmm. we would be watching it from both sides and we would be you know, everyone would be rooting for Draco as much as they were for Harry, yeah. or at least some of us would, right? And so someone would be rooting for Draco, some for Harry, and then you'd end up with this really complicated, you know, story. And I think that's that was really part of the seed, mm -hmm. you know? That, and I think, um, I wrote my thesis in college on the novel Wicked, not the musical, mm -hmm. um, before the musical got made. And the book is totally the book is so different. Good. Yeah, and it's wildly different, right? Completely different. And so um, I feel like that combination of reading the novel Wicked and um, reading Potter and, and seeing there was like room for something different, uh, you know, was a big deal. And the only thing that was interesting was when I started writing it, there were seven other fairy tale school books coming out at the same time, um, and Descendants was getting made around that time. And it was like having to figure out like, okay, like can I find a lane? And yeah. I think the lane was just that the evil kids were treated as protagonists just as much as you know, mm -hmm. the heroes, and ultimately it was up to the audience to decide. So, speaking of the audience, I know you guys have a ton of questions. So, um, let's go to some questions, and uh, we will be game to answer them. All right, so, yeah, let's start with you. Um, after you wrote the books, is there anything you regretted or you wanted to change? And if so, is that did that get changed for the movie? So she asked, after I finished books, is there anything I regretted uh, or wanted to change? And is there something that I wanted to change for the movie? So early on, so it was in development for about 10 years um, mm -hmm. before you know Paul sort of saved us and came on and, and got it made. Um, and before that, it was sort of, you know, it was a long process to get the script where it was. But early on, I remember saying that the gargoyle scene in the book was for those of you who read it, it's a there's a gargoyle that's on the castle, sort of you know terrorizing the kids. But we realize that he's actually a former student um, that has now been turned into a gargoyle's punishment. And I thought, I wish that kid had a face that we knew who that character was. Um, and so in the script, uh, we we created a character named Gregor because his name was similar to gargoyle. So we had Gregor gargoyle. Oh, became, I didn't know that was about. <laughs> so, which became the face of kids who, you know, had been turned into something. Um, so that was one thing where there was an opportunity, you know. But otherwise, I felt like when I wrote each book, I was so in it. They were, I was so, like, deep into the story. And they're so complicated for those of you who've read the books. You know how it is. There's a hundred and 
60 characters in the school for good and evil every book has like yeah. 30 plot lines and they're insane mm -hmm. like i look at them now and i'm just thinking how did i do it um <laughs> because they're so crazy uh but i think each time i just when i was done with it i was done with it and then i would go to the next mm -hmm. and so i never had any regrets other than there are a couple times where i ran out of time and so what i would do is end the book a little early and then the beginning of the next book should have been the ending so uh, the first two chapters of five should have been the end of four, um, and so, like yeah. so, you know, same with three, two and three. But um, otherwise, you know, probably not. What else? Yeah, you're right here. Okay. Um, so I I love all six books. I'm not sure if all the actors read all six books, but um, I'm generally curious to see what scene would you want to see adapted to screen. If hopefully we get all six, I don't know. But what scene would you want to see ad adapted to screen? Oh, let me oh. think. <laughs> Do you have any scene in the book that you felt like you wish was still in the movie or something like that? I'm trying to think if there's a scene from a future book that I would really love to see. I mean, I, I, yeah, tell me. Um, I read the first two books, um, or one and three quarters of yeah. the second book. The scene in the second book where they're on the train, Oh, that, that is awesome. so visual in my head. It's like just like it's, it's so color. visual in my head that it just feels like it has to be in the movie so if we do end up making two and three that would be that would be that would be kind of cool yeah because that flat it's the flower ground um is mm -hmm. so expensive to make <laughs> that it probably would cost an entire movie. Um, probably. But, well, wow, I really just picked like the most complex. Yeah. <laughs> it's an underground subway system made entirely out of four hours. So it's just like insane. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's where Tedros and all the boys are sort of coming after you guys on, on uh, the subway, which would be amazing. Um, I think also you the one the, the one I really think about is you getting to spend a good chunk of the second movie as a boy because i just think that would be awesome yeah like, I'm i think also gonna say that but. yeah as, <laughs> as philip in in the second book because yeah. i just think could you like you, could so you do it <laughs> 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 could i do it <laughs> no, just like, I'm like, take a good look. I what do so. you think i think so i can do what you can do anything you can do anything no no, no just <laughs> I think you could. You could pass. Why are we still on this? We <laughs> <laughs> answered this. I could do it. Absolutely. How about you, Sophia? Any other scenes that, that you remember? Yeah, I actually. Sorry. Um, I was gonna say the same thing that you, uh, or the same thing you said, because I had read um, a portion of the second book, um, and I thought that scene was so visual and so cool, and I was like, how would they make this into something? But I, I mean, after watching um, this first movie, I. I think they could really do, do anything. anything. Yeah, yeah, it's so, so beautiful. Yeah. So. That way also, because Paul does, loves to use practical effects on everything, so it wouldn't just be a CG, it would be, it would be awesome. But it would be very expensive. <laughs> uh, which means all of you better see the first one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, what else? Yeah, you're right in the classes. Um, so for me, the turning point from where I liked Sophie, to, or sorry, I disliked Sophie to liking her, yeah. was the chapter with the beast. And Wait, how, chapter with the beast? Which one? Chapter with the beast. Mm, yeah. And so how she becomes evil because of like self-defense. Yeah. So when you were writing that chapter, did you find it difficult because it is such a linchpin moment? That chapter was interesting because it's dark. You know, you have Sophie committing murder for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I thought to, to you know, <laughs> there's such many times in, like, <laughs> in this series. Um, I felt like I would put myself in Sophie's shoes often, and I felt like if you're in this dungeon where the, the beast's job is to find your greatest fear, and they find it, I always think about, like, you know how something, this is such an esoteric thing, but tell me if you understand. When you have like a personal fear of yourself, but you don't feel like other people notice it, and when they actually do see it in yourself, like they, they call you on something that you think is your secret, like your little mm -hmm. like, you know, secret flaw, and they actually call you on it, you feel this like rage, both at yourself and at them mm -hmm. for finding out, like somehow they found it, and you want them dead. And I feel like that's <laughs> what, in that moment, you know, and I feel like that's what the beast represents. The beast represents finding that fear you're trying to hide. And so when she kills him, I think everyone gets this unconscious sort of little burst of relief that that one person who knew your secret is gone, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I it's very nice. Yeah.
Yeah. You right here. Yeah. And then I'll get one thing back. Oh yeah, tell us. We wanted to play any other characters. What? Oh, are there any other characters you would have liked to play? Now that you like know everybody, is there anyone that you are like, okay, if I couldn't play Sophia Agatha, who would I have liked to play? That's a good question. You know, um, I think I would. Ooh, I would like to play. <laughs> Oh my gosh, either Hester yes. or Kiko. Um, Those are the most opposite characters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Emma plays Kiko, and in the movie, she is the most cute thing ever. And like, she always has the highest pitched voice, and every time she comes on screen, I just want to cry out of joy because she's just so happy. But then Hester is so, so cool. Like, that's how I want to be, just like a mm -hmm. demon tattoo on my back and like it comes alive and like how cool is that? Um, but I don't know, I don't know if I could play Hester. I just would, I think in my head, I would love to be a Hester. That was, it was Hester was my desire to create a character that had no vulnerability. Like <laughs> the, the person you wish you could be in high school yeah. was my, was Hester. Yeah. yeah, yet Freya brings so much vulnerability. Oh my god, she's so scary. Yeah. <laughs> Super scary. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to say Yuba. Oh god. I would love to play Yuba. There's a part where he comes out of a tree and it actually might be one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. It makes me laugh so hard. <laughs> I'm trying to picture you as a garden. Now, now, now if I challenge your acting chops, you're going to throw me out the window. Hey, you've already done that. <laughs> Strike two. Okay. Sophie the Nomi. <laughs> All right, what else? Let's get one from the back. Um, you in the striped shirt uh, back there. Um, so we talked about what social views would be. Oh, God. you got to yell your question. Do you want to stand up and just yell it really loud? <laughs> Oh, what, am I, what do you think my Harry Potter house? <laughs> oh, I was going to say Ravenclaw. Yeah. Oh, so, what? So there is. <laughs> no. Have you ever seen us hang out together? We're just sort of sitting there with these, like, snake eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people. Yeah. The, the two of us hang out together is terrible. Terrible. <laughs> it happens way too often. Way too often for the world to stand much longer without rolling off its axis. All right. Um, let me think. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, as you guys talked um, about how you relate to your characters earlier, what is an aspect uh, about your character that you wish you had? That I wish I had? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what is one aspect of their characters that they wish they had in their, their real life persona? Like a part of Agatha that you that you want to take from the movie now into your life. I just really feel like like I'm her kind of so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. It's a really good question. <laughs> you have a I, whole I feel like if I was to take a character, I wanted Tedros's blind confidence in himself. I feel like he just goes yeah, head rushing right. into any situation, being like, I know how to handle this, and he has no clue, yeah. but he thinks he does. And I feel like that's such a boy thing, and I think I always grew up being very jealous of guys who were so comfortable, just sort of walking into any room. You know those guys in high school who sort of walk in, yeah. the TikTok boys, and they're like, well, yeah. I, can, I can make a crappy dance video, and I think it's the greatest thing in the world. And then it somehow gets like two million views, because I don't know why, but it's that. I think I, I strive to have what Sophie has, and I think I sometimes achieve it. Mm. Like I'm thinking about um, when um, Lady Lasso takes her hair, and that is like her everything. Like her physical beauty is her everything, and that's taken from her. She has to just like, oh, crap, this is the word. And, but she turns it around, and she walks in, and she's rocking it. She's like, all right, you're going to take my hair? Fine, look at me. Look at me now. Like, I want that. I'm yeah. trying to have that, I think. It's funny. We each want the same thing. Oh, what? We each want the same thing, but one from Tedros. I want it from Tedros and one from Sophie. Are we all going to share one mic now? <laughs> 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 okay, I'll answer the question. Um, 
Um, I think for me, I would love to acquire Agatha's dryness and sarcasm. I get so nervous <laughs> making jokes or like being dry or like sassy because I'm like, oh, don't think I mean. So I'll like start laughing before the joke's over. And I'm like, ah, that's fine, right? And it's feel like so awkward. So I'd love to be able to just be so confident in myself and in my sarcasm to just like stare someone deadpan in the eye and be like, yeah, this is a joke and you know it, but I don't need to explain it further. <laughs> all right, I love that we all want confidence. Um, okay, let's go to you in the pink in the corner over there. Um, yeah. from a place of picturing faces. Like I don't have this very like specific human in my mind. And that's why when you see all our uh, like um, official art, it often changes depending on the artist because I feel the character's energy. Like I feel each character is a different color finger glow, which is why they have the different colors in the book because I could feel their energy of what they were. And that's why Tedros and Agatha kind of had that similar, but not quite the same glow. Um, and so for me, it was about like writing their energy. And occasionally, I would see an actress or an actor on screen and feel like, oh, like they have that thing. Like I remember when I first was writing, it was 2012, and I thought that, it's, uh, do you know the actress Sorsha Ronan? Yes, I love her. Like, I remember watching her and being like, she's very Agatha. Like she has that sort of like, <laughs> kind of like off quality, you know? So I remember thinking that she had something to her that was, you know, this was long. A while ago, when I was first writing it, so things like that, where I would sort of feel it in in someone, um, but I never, I never did, I never had like a dream cast or anything like that, you know. And because then ultimately, I think that limits it. Like to me, it has to be an invented character and an invented feeling. Otherwise, you're basing it on mm -hmm. someone who exists, which I was not so into, you know. But good question. All right, a couple more, and then we'll go. You and the glasses back there. Just stand up and uh, y'all really love. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was rereading uh, Hunger Games, and I noticed that the characters cast are cast their in Pollock. Yeah. Is that, was that like inspiration for Oh, not at all. No, I, uh, can't, I didn't read Mockingjay until probably book three or four. Um, I based it on the constellation, because I wanted the, the twins, and I love the idea of Castor and Pollock's twins. Who are not in the movie because that again would have taken the entire budget of the film. Because to make that kind, those kind of, it's just you want to put your money where it's important, you know. So that they were never in any version of the script ever, because it's just too expensive. Yeah, there were things that were more important. So um, what else? Yeah, you're right here in the with the wristbands. Yeah. Um, since you guys have all read the first book, what was your favorite book scene versus movie scene? Oh, interesting. Book, book theme versus movie <laughs> scene? Book scene versus the movie scene. Oh, scene. Book scene versus movie scene. Oh, interesting. Anything jump off into you guys? Do you want me to take this one to save you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been a while. Two years. Um, let me think. Uh, I will say, in terms of where it really gels perfectly, is in terms of where, like, they both have this perfect synergy is when the girls get dropped in the schools. Mm -hmm. It's this like a hair raising chills moment that like it, it just gets that feeling that you guys had when you first read that first book. Remember when they get dropped in the schools, it's on page 26. And you're just like, <laughs> and you're just like I remember writing it and being like, whoa, like, what? Like it's, it's that moment. I feel like on the screen you get that same like, yeah. you know, and, and uh, it's just perfect the way you pulled it. So I feel like it, gives you that um, feeling. I think, you know, there's scenes that you just can't do because it's so expensive or it doesn't make sense. Like, I love the foxes scene in mm -hmm. the book because I think it's so creepy and weird. <laughs> and I get weird DMs from furries every once in a while. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't do that in the movie because you have two amazing actresses. Why would you turn them into foxes? Do you know what I mean? And why would you turn Agatha into a cockroach for 10 chapters? So, oh my God, I forgot about that. 
We're actually going to turn into a bug for a very long time. So again, why would we waste <laughs> precious screen time with something? Horror is a bug. <laughs> so, you know, stuff like that. When the other thing is, is Corporate Evil really, because it takes place in such a fantasy world, there's so much that happens in that book. That could fill 20 movies easily mm -hmm. and a trillion dollar budget. So you do have to make those choices. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess from the book, uh, one of the scenes I really love is the beautiful all along, Agatha, you've been beautiful all along scene um, between Dovey and Agatha. I thought that scene was really nice just because of the fact that we all have this perception of ourselves that is so based in uh, everyone else's perception of us um, and the way that they treat us. And then the instant we think that maybe someone is nice to us, then our whole version of ourselves change. Even if there's nothing that actually physically changed, it's just the way that we believe the world is looking at us. Um, so I think that's just a really great message to show uh, for a lot of girls out there that your worth does not come from the way other people treat you. Um, it all comes from within. And I think the other thing I remember when I was writing that scene partially was because I grew up feeling so awkward and ugly as a teenager. And I felt like if I was at the school for good, I would have been the Agatha being like, this place sucks, like whatever, <laughs> you know? But at the end of the day, she needed that school mm -hmm. to get that thing. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, she went in there and like she could say it sucks all she wants, but at the end of the day, in order to find yourself, she needed it. And I feel like, you know, I made fun of Disney princes and princesses all the time because I felt like I never felt, I never looked like them, I never felt like them. But at the end of the day, I wanted that confidence, that thing they had, the thing we were talking about that all three of us want. And ultimately, the school for good, I think, I created in order to have that fantasy universe that I could have gone into to get that confidence, to have that Agatha moment in them. I remember writing that. Um, this is a funny story about that mirror scene. I wrote it, and originally Debbie gave her a makeover. And, uh, or in my head she was going to. And so when Agatha goes to the mirror and turns, I was going to be, I was about to write the passage being like, oh, and then she turned and she had done all this stuff to her and everything. And then I was like, oh, wait, nothing happened. So I hadn't even thought of it until that moment. And only in that moment, I think I had the realization for myself at the same time that the character had it. And it was this super powerful moment. I think it was one of the few times I cried when I was writing a scene, because I remember it being very like deep and emotional, you know? Realizing like, oh wait, why does she have to change? So yeah, that was that. All right, two more, and then we'll, we'll go. Okay, you in the uh, sweater. Yeah, right there. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, when I first read the book, like I, I, <laughs> I, I, I remember sitting in the corner in like the middle of like in like fourth grade, like just sitting in the corner reading the book and fully for like Sophie. Yeah. And why do you think people think like Sophie? Because I remember like that's a good like, question. Do you want to answer that one first? Why do people why do you think people, you know, don't like Sophie as much? Or why don't they like Sophie in general? Uh, she's hard and she's tough and she's intimidating. Um, I think intimidation People, when people are intimidated by somebody and their confidence or the way that they put themselves forward, people often don't like them. I feel like, I feel like I feel like that sometimes. Um, so I, I'd say she's really intimidating. It's the first reason people probably don't like her. She's also mean to the sweetest, you know, character that everybody really relates to. That's probably why people don't like her in the book. In the movie, <clears throat> I try to make her all of that sass and confidence and intimid intimidating that she is in the book, but I also, you know. I want you guys to like her. I don't want, what book did you say it took for testing to, for people to stop wanting Sophie to die? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what book was that? Oh, it was probably by the fifth, yeah. By the fifth book, okay, well I'm hoping by the end of the first movie <laughs> <laughs> you guys will love Sophie. Um, yeah. And I think the, the other thing is that she was, the mandate for her was to create a Disney princess who knew she was meant to be a Disney princess. A Disney princess who wanted to be a Disney princess. And all of a sudden that makes them unlikable because female ambition yeah. mm -hmm. somehow yeah, is, mean, you know, that's it. And so it was based on the fact that I grew up idolizing Madonna. And I felt like people <laughs> hated Madonna because Madonna had the ambitions of a man. And I wanted a female character who just wanted what she wanted and had no apologies for it. Yeah. So yeah. All right, last one. 
What are we gonna do? Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. If you could keep any of the costumes that you wore, which one would you keep? Oh, good question. Is it across the street? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that thing yet, but there's like a display. Yeah. Hey, we're going out. Look in the closet. <laughs> um, all of them. Like, <laughs> I, I remember my first fitting that I had when we were in London for pre-production. I turned to Renee, the head of wardrobe, and I said, I don't think I can do this movie because I love all of these dresses and like literally the first scene I had, one of the first scenes I had to film, I had to be in this beautiful pink floral dress um, and I had to act like I hated it but the whole time I'm like, ah! <laughs> like this is my dream, like I've always, I've always fantasized about being a princess and wearing all the dresses and finding the prince and so getting to have all of that and then act like I hated it was so difficult um, but I think specifically I really really loved these two dresses that I wore that are barely in the movie now but um, they were kind of inspired by Bridgerton I don't know if you guys have seen that yeah. show yeah yeah so so good Read the book. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so the neckline of the dress is like kind of square, and then the sleeves are puffy, and both of the dresses look quite similar, but uh, no, no, that's, uh, that was the Trial of Tales one. You like, yeah, you have so many good ones too. Um, but yeah, I just really like those dresses because they felt so feminine, but they also were so comfortable, and like, I just, I felt like I could frolic in a field for hours in it, and I, I, I begged to take it home, but they did not let me. <laughs> um, I love all of my costumes, including the potato sack, and it was, it, was like towards the, it was right at the beginning of shooting that she was wearing these gorgeous things, and I was wearing this sack that I wear when I first get to the schools, um, but I make up for it with a pretty epic fashion montage. I don't know if you guys saw, they released it on Instagram, um, and I think in the one part that they released, you can see it, there's this, um, all of my, all of our costumes were handmade, custom built for all of us with all these beautiful custom fabrics and stuff, but there was this one piece, it was actually an antique piece, and it has these pointy shoulders and these little buttons that go all the way down, and it's black, and these shoulders just go up, and it's long sleeve, it's super... Victorian and Gothic and awesome. Uh, I'd probably keep just that corset if I had to choose one item. One item. I did actually keep the bloomers that went under my Gabbleton dress, though I stole them. Because <laughs> there was there was ten. Pa Paul's looking at me like, "What do you do?" Uh, there was ten pairs. I just took one. Jeez. <laughs> that was the world's best scene to write. I think I rewrote it a hundred times the fashion montage scene because I didn't want to just keep. I didn't want to move on. It's just so much fun to write with the the clothes. Um, all right. Well, we have a special guest with us here today to join us for the signing. Our amazing director, Paul B. <laughs> so, do you, is there a chair? Put the three on. Oh, one right there. Perfect. Um, and so Paul's going to join us for the signing. Does anyone, we can ask, does anyone have a question for Paul? Anything they're dying to know about the movie? Yeah, go for oh, it. Oh, about the movie? Yeah. Uh, there's something else for your other work. I oh, don't yeah. know if I'm allowed okay. to ask. So when I first heard that you were directing the movie, I, I'm a huge Freaks and Geeks fan. So now that we're in a place where there's a lot of sequels and reboots and everything, would you ever come back to doing Freaks and Geeks? Oh, just saying, I, I, my creator show called Freaks and Geeks, and uh, she's a fan. Um, thank you, by the way. Um, I don't know, I mean, there's, she's wondering if there would ever be a, a sequel or anything to that. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm very much into the idea of, like, you get something perfect, and then you just walk away from right. it and don't go back to it. Also, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to do it with the, with the cast now because... I, I feel like any of those kind of like you know later in life sequels are always a little or like reboots or something. Maybe a reboot. Together. Yeah, I mean it's always possible. I mean it, it's it, I was when I created that show I was much closer <laughs> in age to when, when you know I remembered high school and all that. Now you know being young is so different from my experience <laughs> that I, I would yeah. have to bring in you know a lot of people to write it um, just because I, I wouldn't be able to you know give you the true experience that you want. Yeah. But the funny thing is that. You know, so many people when they see I directed this movie because I do a lot of movies like Bridesmaids, yeah. you, you know, these big kind of R-rated comedies, and so people are like, "Oh, we didn't ever thought you'd do a movie like this," but I say, "This is just freaks and geeks with magic." So <laughs> yeah. that's all I, I look at it. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I know you're not a director, but I'm curious. Um, 
Um, so how difficult was it to adapt like the world of school for good and evil, which had like Saman as a story for so long into your own vision? Yeah, the question is how long, how hard was it to adapt? It was very hard to adapt. I mean, you guys struggled with it for seven years before it even yeah, got yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, it's, Saman's is such an inventive author that there's so much stuff in there that literally, like you said, it would cost a trillion dollars and it'd be like a 20 hour long thing. So you, what you had to do is really find the key moments uh, that tie the story together in the most emotional way, give you the, the fun that you want, but really it's all about those characters. And, you know, and when, I was, when I came on board and started doing the rewrite, I was constantly talking to someone, basically saying like, what do the fans want? What would they be sad if they didn't have? And I will say that your favorite scene of the book about you know being transformed, we actually shot that, uh, and it's so beautiful. And I'm going to try to have it put out as a deleted scene because you and Carrie are so amazing in the scene where she basically says, "I'm not pretty enough," um, and it's just wonderful. It just it just we had so much movie, and it just didn't for some reason. When you're putting a movie together, it's a real straight line, and anything that kind of takes a deviation tends to get pushed out, especially since the movie was coming about three hours long uh, at that point. So we got it down to like two hours and 15 minutes long. But but I, I want everybody to see that. You and Carrie just are incredible, yeah, yeah, yeah. incredible. All right, well, let's, because um, we got to, I know all of you want to your stuff signed, so it's going to be, <laughs> we, better, we better start. Um, so uh, everyone's going to sign your books and everything like that. Once you get to me, I can only do three. But I can do, if you guys have three books, I can do that. In terms of photos, Rachel, do you want to explain how it's going to go? Okay. Please, 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 please. Speaking of photo, I would actually love it if I could get a photo of you guys with everybody. Oh, yeah. Would it be possible to have you guys stand right here in front of it and face me? And everybody in the audience, hold up your books. Super, super high. Ooh, it looks so pretty. <laughs> All right, guys, let's squeeze in. Oh, trust me, you can see their books. Awesome, okay, I got it. Thank you guys so much. All right, so we will have a bookseller here. Can you turn on the music? We will have a bookseller here to take photos for you. If you could have it ready on the camera app when you get up to the front, that would be lovely. We're gonna start one row at a time. So row two, if you guys can stand up, we're gonna line you over here. And we'll bring you up to the table to 